finds himself back where he started from. Certainly no one who has not lived a considerable time in this labyrinth can find his way through it. If I may use the word at all, in speaking of this district, the ventilation of these streets and courts is, in consequence of this confusion, quite as imperfect as in the Irk region, and if this quarter may, nevertheless, be said to have some advantage over that of the Irk, the houses being newer and the streets occasionally having gutters, nearly every house has, on the other hand, a cellar dwelling, which is rarely found in the Irk district. By reason of the greater age and more careless construction of the houses, as for the rest, the filth, debris, and offal heaps, and the pools in the streets, are common to both quarters, and in the district now under discussion, another feature most injurious to the cleanliness of the inhabitants, is the multitude of pigs walking about in all the alleys, rooting into the offal heaps, or kept imprisoned in small bends. Here, as in most of the working men's quarters of Manchester, the poor crazes rent the courts and build pig pens in them. In almost every court one or even several such pens may be found, into which the inhabitants of the court throw or refuse an offal, whence the swine grow fat, and the atmosphere, confined on all four sides, is utterly corrupted by putrefying animal and vegetable substances. Through this quarter, a broad and measurably decent street has been cut, Miller Street, and the background has been pretty successfully concealed. But if anyone should be led by curiosity, to pass through one of the numerous passages which lead into the courts, he will find this piggery repeated at every twenty paces. Such is the old town of Manchester, and on rereading my description, I am forced to admit that instead of being exaggerated, it is far from black enough to convey a true impression of the filth, ruin, and uninhabitableness, the defiance of all considerations of cleanliness, ventilation, and health which characterize the construction of this single district, containing at least twenty to thirty thousand inhabitants. And such a district exists in the heart of the second city of England, the first manufacturing city of the world. If anyone wishes to see in how little space a human being can move, how little air and such air he can breathe, how little of civilization he may share and yet live, it is only necessary to travel hither. True, this is the old town, and the people of Manchester emphasize the fact, whenever anyone mentions to them the frightful condition of this hell upon earth, but what does that prove? Everything which here arouses horror and indignation is of recent origin, belongs to the industrial epoch. The couple of hundred houses, which belong to old Manchester, have been long since abandoned by their original inhabitants, the industrial epoch alone has crammed into them the swarms of workers whom they now shelter, the industrial epoch alone has built up every spot between these old houses, to win a covering for the masses whom it has conjured hither from the agricultural districts and from Ireland, the industrial epoch alone enables the owners of these cattle sheds to rent them for high prices to human beings, to plunder the poverty of the workers, to undermine the health of thousands, in order that they alone, the owners, may grow rich. In the industrial epoch alone has it become possible, that the workers scarcely freed from feudal servitude could be used as mere material, a mere chattel, that he must let himself be crowded into a dwelling too bad for every other, which he for his hard-earned wages buys the right to let go utterly to ruin. This manufacture has achieved, which, without these workers, this poverty, this slavery could not have lived. True, the original construction of this quarter was bad, little good could have been made out of it, but, have the landowners, has the municipality done anything to improve it when rebuilding? On the contrary, wherever an accor corner was free, a house has been run up, where a superfluous passage remained, it has been built up, the value of land rose with the blossoming out of manufacture, and the more it rose, the more madly was the work of building up carried on, without reference to the health or comfort of the inhabitants, with sole reference to the highest possible profit on the principle, that no hole is so bad, but that some poor creature must take it who can pay for nothing better. However, it is the old town, and with this reflection the bourgeoisie is comforted. Let us see, therefore, how much better it is in the new town. The new town, known also as Irish town, stretches up a hill of clay, beyond the old town, between the Oak and St. George's Road. Here all the features of a city are lost. 
single rows of houses or groups of streets stand, here and there, like little villages on the naked, not even grass-grown clay soil. The houses, or rather cottages, are in bad order, never repaired, filthy, with damp, unclean, cellar dwellings. The lanes are neither paved, nor supplied with sewers, but harbour numerous colonies of swine penned in small styes or yards, or wandering unrestrained through the neighbourhood. The mud in the streets is so deep that there is never a chance, except in the driest weather, of walking without sinking into a tank all deep at every step. In the vicinity of St. George's Road, the separate groups of buildings approach each other more closely, ending in a continuation of lanes, blind alleys, back lanes and courts, which grow more and more crowded, and irregularly nearer they approach the heart of the town. True, they are here often are paved or supplied with paved sidewalks and gutters, but the filth, the bad order of the houses, and especially of the cellars, remains the same. It may not be out of place to make some general observations just here as to the customary construction of working men's quarters in Manchester. We have seen how in the old town pure accident determined the grouping of the houses in general. Every house is built without reference to any other, and the scraps of space between them are called courts for want of another name. In the somewhat newer portions of the same quarter, and in other working men's quarters, dating from the early days of industrial activity, a somewhat more orderly arrangement may be found. The space between two streets is divided into more regular, usually square courts. These courts were built in this way from the beginning, and communicate with the streets by means of covered passages. If the totally planless construction is injurious to the health of the workers by preventing ventilation, this method of shutting them up in courts, surrounded on all sides by buildings, is far more so. The air simply cannot escape, the chimneys of the houses are the sole drains for the imprisoned atmosphere of the courts, and they serve the purpose, only so long as fire, is kept burning 55 moreover, the houses surrounding such courts are usually built back to back, having the rear wall in common, and this alone suffices to prevent any sufficient through ventilation. And, as the police charged with care of the streets, does not trouble itself about the condition of these courts, as everything quietly lies, where it is thrown, there is no cause for wonder at the filth and heaps of ashes and offal to be found here. I have been in courts, in Miller Street, at least half a foot below the level of the thoroughfares, and without the slightest drainage for the water, that accumulates in them in rainy weather. More recently another different method of building was adopted, and has now become general. Working men's cottages are almost never built singly, but always by the dozen or score, a single contractor building up one or two streets at a time. These are then arranged as follows one front is formed of cottages of the best class, so fortunate as to possess a back door and small court, and these command the highest rent. In the rear of these cottages runs a narrow alley, the back street, built up at both ends, into which either a narrow roadway or a covered passage leads from one side. The cottages which face this back street command least rent, and are most neglected. These have their rear walls in common with the third row of cottages which face a second street, and command less rent than the first row and more than the second. By this method of construction, comparatively good ventilation can be obtained for the first row of cottages, and the third row is no worse off than in the former method. The middle row, on the other hand, is at least as badly ventilated as the houses in the courts, and the back street is always in the same filthy, disgusting condition as they. The contractors prefer this method, because it saves them space, and furnishes the means of fleecing better paid workers through the higher rents of the cottages in the first and third rows. These three different forms of cottage building, are found all over Manchester, and throughout Lancashire and Yorkshire, often mixed up together, but usually separate enough to indicate the relative age of parts of towns. The third system, that of the back alleys, prevails largely in the great working men's district east of St George's Road and Ancote Street, and is the one most often found in the other working men's quarters of Manchester and its suburbs. In the last mentioned broad district included under the name Ancoats, stand the largest mills of Manchester lining the canals, colossal six- and seven-storey buildings towering with their slender chimneys far above the low cottages of the workers. The population of the district consists, therefore, chiefly of mill hands, and in the worst streets, of hand withers. The streets nearest the heart of the town are the oldest, and consequently the worst. They are, however, paved and supplied with drains. Among them I include those nearest to and parallel with Oldham Road and Great Ancoats Street. 
Farther to the northeast lie many newly built up streets. Here the cottages look neat and cleanly, doors and windows are new and freshly painted, the rooms within newly whitewashed, the streets themselves are better aired, the vacant building lots between them larger and more numerous. But this can be said of a minority of the houses only, while cellar dwellings are to be found under almost every cottage, many streets are unpaved and without sewers, and, worse than all, this neat appearance is all pretense, a pretense which vanishes within the first ten years. For the construction of the cottages individually is no less to be condemned than the plan of the streets.